We're in a sermon series on signs. And we are talking about those things that we encounter when we're driving down the road. This particular week, we're talking about railroad crossings. And you come to those signs, and there, you know, there's these big signs like this. In fact, if you look back in history, you can actually find some railroad crossing signs that literally say death across the top. It's a dangerous thing to cross. Um, and in Iowa, you can encounter these all over the place. You can encounter them out on the gravel roads. You can encounter them in the cities. You, you name it, you're going to find railroad crossings. Have you ever come to one of those railroad crossings and, and you get there and maybe just before you get there, all of a sudden the lights start flashing and then the ding starts going ding, ding, bing, 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 bing. And if you're at one of those that is really fancy, they even have the arms that go and closes down in front and, and you're not supposed to go through, right? Anybody show up at one of those and had to stop and wait for a train? Yes, okay. Uh, I have two. Have you ever counted, have you ever counted the trains? The, the cars? I've counted the cars before. And there's, there's times I've counted the cars like up to 180. It's ridiculous how many cars they can get on there and get to go with the, the steam engine. Okay, but let me ask this question. Have you ever gotten to one of these intersections and all of a sudden the lights are going bing, 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 and you stop and you look? <laughs> you know what I... Where's the train? Have you ever looked and said, where's the train? I don't see the train. Can I go? Can I not go? If, am I, if I go, is there going to be a train? Should I not go? You guys, you guys see some of you smiling. Yeah, you've been there. I remember stopping at one that, I, that there, there was gate, so I wasn't really going to get around anyone, but I just sat there like five minutes, and finally I'm like, okay, there is no train. I can't. There was even one that I stopped at. I could see the train, but it was sitting there. I'm like, okay, is it just going to stay down as long as the train's right there i don't there was one that i had to like drive around five miles to get to another intersection so that i could actually go over the railroad tracks um i spoke to uh pastor wendy was sharing sermon series and she said she actually grew up in a town where down the street they would have one that would misfire all the time and this this railroad track would go off all night long or all day long and be going bing 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 how would you like that in your backyard? Or how would you like that when you have to go somewhere and you want to get there and you get to this danger sign that's saying, stay out, don't cross, you could die. Would you, actually, should, maybe I should ask, would you be one of those that would look both ways and maybe try and scoot across? Some of you, yeah. <laughs> Some of you going, yeah, yeah. It's kind of silly just to sit there and wait. I know others who would say, nope, I can't do that. I'm not even going to think about crossing that. Bing, bing, bing. There's something intimidating about it. And in fact, how often in life do we encounter something that feels dangerous and it's really not? How often do we see something, we react to it, or it prevents us from going where we need to go or doing what we need to do because it's got this signal saying we shouldn't cross? Have you ever been intimidated out of going through with your action and with your direction or your mission and purpose because someone threw up a sign of danger? Our passage today finds John the Baptist and his disciples and Jesus. In fact, if we look at the players today, we find John the, John the Baptist, excuse me a second, <coughs> that works. John the Baptist and his disciples, we find Jesus, and we find this, this Jew who's kind of maybe stirring things up. We don't know a whole lot of details, but he begins the conversation by talking to the disciples and asking some questions, and then something happens. But before I get there, let's back up. I want to just help us understand the whole context here because we're only in chapter 3 of John. So we're not very far into the story. So let's just back up and get a whole picture because at the beginning of John, we find John, uh, we, we find Jesus is referred to as in the beginning was the Word, the Word made flesh. That's kind of an exciting way to think of Jesus. And then after that, Jesus comes to be baptized by John and John baptizes him. But let's just put in context again, what does John do when he first sees Jesus coming? John knew who Jesus was. He saw Jesus coming, and, and the first thing he does is he looks and beholds, and he turns to his disciples. He turns to all those who had come, and they were ready to be baptized by, by John, and he looks and he points at Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Woo! Talk about a declaration. Talk about clarifying who somebody is. He doesn't say, Hey, that's Jesus. That's my cousin. That's the guy. No, no he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. And then Jesus walks up and says, hey, baptize me. 
And John says, whoa, no, 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 no. I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes. I can't touch, I can't touch your feet. And Jesus says, no, it's good. It's right. Let's do this. And of course, you know, Jesus is baptized. He comes up out of the water and, and this dove comes down and this voice from heaven says, behold, my son in whom I'm well pleased. Wow. Talk about one of those, oh, kind of moments, right? Talk about ah moments in the Bible. That's one of those we look back. I said, that was powerful. Can you imagine being one of John's disciples there to witness this magnificent event? How impactful that would be to you to see the Lamb of God, to see him baptized, hear the voice of God. Wow. So that takes place. And then Jesus begins his ministry. He calls his disciples. And and then he goes and actually he's going to a wedding he does his first miracle. We find out that that happens. And, and when he's at the wedding, of course, his, his mother says, hey, they're, they're out of wine. Would you fix this for them? And like, it's not really my time, but I suppose. And what's he do? He, makes, he turns 160 gallons of water into wine. I mean, it's not just a little bottle. It's, it's 160 gallons. It's, it's a big size miracle. Just so nobody misses it, he makes 160 gallons of wine. Okay, and then Jesus, after he does this, we, we come to chapter 3, and Jesus encounters this, this Pharisee who's kind of asking questions. He's curious. He's, he's not sure. He's seeking wisdom in Jesus. He says, how do I get to heaven? Well, you must be born again. Well, whoa, just a second. How do you do that? Remember, he asked, a, that's a confusing question. How do I enter back into my mom's womb and be born again? I, I don't get this. I mean, and Jesus said, no, there, there's a difference. You don't get this? I, I, there's, a, there's a physical, there's a spiritual, and this is what needs to be reborn. So he's, he's teaching, and Jesus is taking the position of authority and teaching even the Pharisees, and, and all of a sudden, he now takes his disciples out, and he begins baptizing. He begins actually bringing people to Jesus, and people are flocking to Jesus. And I think, I think wow, this is an exciting part of the story. Things are getting good. They're going in the right direction. Everything is just smooth sailing from here. And then all of a sudden on the other side of the river, here's John and his disciples and his disciples gather around John and they start going beep, 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 beep. Ding, 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 ding. Hey, there's a problem here. They shouldn't be going over there. They should, this is, John, you do the baptisms, right? Don't go to this Jesus guy. They, they were putting up warning signals like a railroad crossing. There's something wrong. The truth is they were scared, weren't they? They were scared of the change that was coming about. In fact, I I love the way that they referred to him. They they didn't even refer to Jesus. I mean, they they knew Jesus. They watched him baptize. They seen this powerful miracle take place. And and all of a sudden, they see him and they refer to him. Hey, that man, that, that guy that was with you, that guy that you baptized, that guy. They didn't even call him Jesus. He's over there doing baptisms. That guy. You shouldn't be doing baptisms. This is your job, John. They saw Jesus as a rival. They treated him with disdain. They began exaggerating. By the way, did you know that when we have, start to have conflict with somebody, whether at work or at home or others, we start to exaggerate. Do you know anybody who does this? Like make everything bigger than it really is. Well, that's what they did. What they did is they began saying, hey, Everybody's going over to Jesus. Everybody. We're not going to get anybody over here anymore, John. Come on. Things are falling apart. We've got to fix things. You can't let them go over there. They were jealous. They were trying to protect their master, John. They were trying to keep the status quo just the way it was because that's what they were comfortable with. They didn't like the idea of change at all, let alone change even for the Messiah. (laughs) Hmm. Have you ever encountered that? Somebody who's not comfortable with change? Don't want to let go of control or authority? They were going off like these false alarms at a railroad crossing. Ding, 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 ding. But there was nothing really there to be afraid of. In fact, it was good stuff that was happening, but, but they were setting off an alarm and trying to prevent John from letting this happen. They were stirring up jealousy, rivalry, trying to convince John to stand up for his position, tell him that it was his right. You know what makes this even more powerful? It was his group of friends. It was his disciples. 
you ever had that happen to you? I mean, something's going on and there's a conflict maybe between you and somebody else. And then all of a sudden you've got your friends. You've got those people who gather around you and they're right there for support and say, hey, we got your back. Come on, you know, you know you're right. You know, push this button a little bit more. Push this harder. You, you know, we're right there for you. You can't let them treat you like that. You know what I'm talking about? This was John's friends saying, hey, you can't let that happen. Hey, we got your back. Come on, baptism is your thing. You go and tell Jesus to go somewhere else. You go and tell Jesus he can't do that. What's it like when your friends gather around you and start supporting you? In fact, telling you that there's danger somewhere that maybe there's not even danger to be seen. They're trying to protect us from something that's not even really there. I mean, I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen in church. I've seen people say, hey, don't go on that mission trip because, you know, that country's not safe. Don't go downtown and feed the homeless. I mean, that, that's not a safe place to be. Have you heard these things? Don't teach your assistant manager all of your tricks because, you know, they're just going to take your job. Don't empower someone else because who knows what they're going to do. They're going to trample on you. Don't let Jesus baptize. Not, don't let that man baptize because that's your job, John. Don't give up control. Don't let things change. You see, perceived dangers are often bigger than reality itself anyway, isn't it? And giving up control is hard for us. You know what is the most powerful part of this passage for me? It's John's response. John's response is inspiring to me. John didn't react. John didn't like get all excited by his friends who were coming around him and, and kind of cheering him on, kind of stirring the pot, if you will. He didn't get jealous. He didn't get angry. He didn't try to compete. He didn't even send his disciples out on some new advertising campaign to bring all of the people back to be baptized by him. He didn't go about things that way. You know, when I think about John the Baptist, I think we're familiar with other stories. We're familiar with the story of, of the baptism. We're, we're familiar with all of the people who came out to him. We think he's a pretty neat guy. In fact, you want to talk about manly men in the Bible. I mean, there's not too many that got away with wearing camel's fur and eating honey and locusts. I mean, that's pretty, like, awesome, cool for a character in the Bible, right? But when I think about greatest moments for, for people in the Bible, and I think about greatest moments for John the Baptist, I don't think about those other moments. I think about this one. I think about this moment right here where John did something that was absolutely amazing. He was humble. And in humility, he let go of control and power. He let go of the way things had been. And in fact, he did something even braver than that. He stood up to all of his followers. He stood up to his own disciples and said, I think you're misunderstanding something. You know what courage that takes? John had a ministry and a purpose. He was the one who would precede the Messiah. He wasn't deterred by his, the encouragement of his disciples. He wasn't deterred by all of this change going on. And in fact, he stood up and he corrected them. In fact, let's, let's just take a moment and look at the things that John did in this moment. John, the first thing John did is he points to heaven and says, wait, 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 you got things wrong. Everything that we receive is a gift from heaven. He took a moment to clear the air. He said, this isn't a disagreement between Jesus and I. This isn't a, a conflict of, of human space. In fact, let's get our focus back where it needs to be. Let's look to heaven. Because when we can all look to heaven together, you know, we get our eyes off of the conflict that's right here. You know, the truth is, I've seen, I've seen in churches where the conflict just begins and it's between people or it's this issue or that issue or my priority, your priority, and it becomes this rather than this. I think John gets it right, doesn't he? He points to heaven and says, everything that we receive is a gift from heaven. And then he, points, he humbles himself again and he says, hey, you are all witnesses. You are all witnesses to what I said, that I am not the Christ. I'm only the forerunner. I'm the one who prepares the way. I am not the Christ. Don't lift me up. Look to the one who does have authority. Then he declares Jesus the bridegroom, doesn't he? 
He begins talking this metaphor, but it's Jesus is the bridegroom, and all these people that are gathering, all these people that are flocking to Jesus at this moment, this is the bride. And he begins to talk in this way that, that makes it very understandable that John sees what's happening. Jesus is gathering the bride or the church to him. And then John clarifies, he says, by the way, I'm just the friend. I'm the friend of the bride and the bridegroom. And that's kind of exciting. I mean, if you're the friend of the bride and the bridegroom and you see, you go to a wedding and you see this, this merge of relationship that is just beautiful, you, you're happy for them. You get so excited. You're just joyful, even tearful, filled with joy because you see the right thing happening. And John says, I'm just the friend who is witnessing true joy when the bride and the bridegroom come together. I think that's beautiful because John finds joy in letting go and John finds joy in handing on authority. John is not worried about maintaining his position. And maybe we could learn something from John, couldn't we? Maybe we could learn that the right thing in some situations is stop fearing something that's not there. Maybe we could learn to let go of control or power Maybe we should stop pointing at each other and maybe start pointing to heaven, pointing people to heaven. And maybe we could find joy. We can find joy when we see people coming into a relationship with God. I think his last line is pretty powerful. He must increase, and I must de decrease. I sometimes think I will never stop learning from that one. In every moment of life, in every breath, every relationship, every scenario, he must increase, and I must decrease. What does it look like if I live that out in my life? Today I want to challenge you to think about who you are. Who are you in this story? Are, are you John or are you one of John's disciples? Are there certain relationships or conflicts? Are, are there things at work or with family where you feel this tension and there's this conflict going back and forth? Maybe even there's, there's a group of people gathering around and stirring the pot a little bit. Maybe you need to have courage to stand up to them and say, no, let's, let's get our eyes off of this and look to this. In, it's okay. Let's let go of control. <laughs> Change is okay. Maybe we need to be the ones that are humble like John. Maybe we're the, we need to stop seeing danger that's not really there. I want to challenge you today to begin to think, what is it that you need to let go of? Who do you need to stand up to? What pot do you need to stop letting be stirred?